Good morning everybody. Thank you very much for coming along this morning. Um, this is our first fraud regulatory and corporate crime, a bit of a mouthful, but our first FRCC breakfast uh, seminar. Um, we're going to deal with four or five issues pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say they're little teasers for you. Uh, because if there are any subjects that we cover today which you would like covering in more detail, we're very happy to come into your businesses, into your chambers, wherever it may be, just to give a, a more fulsome analysis of the subject matter that we're dealing with. So, uh, I said I'd do a very quick update on two or three cases. The first one is VTB. Now, the interesting point about VTB, and I know David's here from Essex Court Chambers, um, Essex Court Chambers and in particular Paul McGrath are acting on that actually in the Supreme Court today and have been for the last couple of days. But it's, it's a very, very important case about piercing the corporate veil. Uh, there were a couple of cases that uh, Mr Justice Burton um, uh, gave judgments on and it looked as if the tide was turning. It looked as if the tide was turning in that the corporate veil could be pierced in relation to contractual claims. Uh, where certain factors were in play. Now VTB, unfortunately from my view, but probably as a traditionalist is the correct view, has reverted the law to where it was pre-Burton's judgments in that now it is still incredibly difficult to pierce the corporate veil. Now there are exceptional circumstances which would allow someone to bring a claim, a contractual claim, uh, against uh, a non-contracting party. But those exceptional circumstances are very rigid and, and, and very rare in that, and primarily they are twofold. First, that the controller, the person who is in effect committing the fraud behind the scenes, is a controller of the company uh, which is subject to the litigation. So he is a director, shareholder, controller in whatever guise, but he is behind the scenes. He is the puppeteer, let's say. But it also has to be uh, established that he is actually using the company structure in order to create the fraud, to create the breach of contract in effect. The facade is the actual corporate structure which is the actual defendant in the proceedings. Now in the VTB case it involved a loan agreement, a loan agreement for 225 million US dollars. And the, the claimant wanted to bring a contractual claim against three other parties, an individual and two other companies, which were not parties to the contract. However, the individual, the controller, Mr. Malafave, he wanted, uh, the, the claimant wanted to bring that individual and his two associated companies within the claim in this jurisdiction. Now, if, if the claimant could have brought a contractual claim, he could have brought the proceedings in this jurisdiction. The court confirmed you've got a very good claim in tort, the tort of deceit. These individuals, this com these companies did induce by deception the defendant, the contracting party, to enter, uh, to, to persuade the plaintiff claimant to enter into the loan agreement. But the court said it would be merely fanciful to say that these, this individual and these companies had ever intended to enter into the contract. Had ever entered, the, had, had, had the privity of contract in effect to justify them being seen as a, a, as a contracting party, and therefore the, 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 the corporate veil which applied could not be pierced in those circumstances. Now, it's a very important decision in relation to corporate veil, but it's also important in that it's enhanced the principle of privity of contract. And in many cases, we look as the claimant, look for other defendants. We look for other individuals, controllers, companies. Unfortunately, this case has not given us the ability, in effect, to go after other individuals for breach of contract claims. The problem in that case was, although there was a good claim for the tort of deceit, that could not be brought within the English jurisdiction because the tort had been committed outside England and Wales. But that has gone to the Supreme Court, actually, as I say, it's the third day of the Supreme Court hearing and I understand from Paul McGrath that it is not necessarily going that well. <laughs> so it looks as if the Supreme Court judges will uh, endorse the view that uh, privity of contract reigns. <laughs>
The second case is the Perry case against the Serious Organised Crime Agency and I know we've got some experts in the audience who do a lot of work in this particular field. Uh, we've got James Earp, I think, here from Grant Thornton who's uh, uh, responsible for collecting in, freezing, restraining assets under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Um, there's a real oddity here in the way in which the legislation was drafted. This is the Proceeds of Crime Act. Parts 2, 3 and 4, which relate to confiscation of assets, provided for confiscation of assets in effect on a worldwide basis. But Part 5, which relates to uh, in effect, the freezing of assets and, and in effect the civil recovery of assets under the Proceeds of Crime Act, was limited to England and Wales. Now, it was always believed, I think, by a serious organised crime agency that that was a mere slip in effect and that they could always try to recover assets under a civil recovery order on a worldwide basis, which is the ordinary course in civil proceedings. And that was actually enhanced and endorsed by both the lower court and the Court of Appeal. But unfortunately, on a 7-2 uh, majority, the Supreme Court uh, found that Part 5 and civil recovery orders could only apply to the recovery of assets in England and Wales. So it really has neutered the effect of the Proceeds of Crime Act and neutered the ability of a serious organised crime agency to go after assets on a worldwide basis. And when you consider that most frauds, most criminal acts these days do involve the dissipation of assets offshore, that will be a serious problem to the serious organised crime agency going forward. And I understand from James that the Home Office is looking at it at present and is potentially looking at changing the legislation to add a few words in effect at property in England and Wales and overseas. That also includes Scotland and Northern Ireland for Alan Walker's purposes. Um, Finally, Abliazov. Um, now, there have been so many interim applications and there's been so many judgments on Abliazov. I could probably spend from now until Christmas just giving you a run through of those particular applications. But the three key ones, as far as we're concerned, which are extremely relevant to lawyers and to practitioners, to forensics, to companies who are uh, working or subject to a fraud, are the following. The first one is funding. It's an accepted, or it, it, we thought it was an accepted rule of law that if monies were provided to a defendant by a loan agreement, in effect outside the remit of a freezing injunction, then the defendant could use those monies in effect to pay off legal expenses and living expenses and would not have to seek the permission of the court would not have to seek the permission of the other party, as in the claimant, to actually release those funds to pay living and legal expenses. And in these big fraud cases, we only know too well, that you can be spending hundreds of thousands of pounds every month on legal fees. And that is not necessarily available if you have to start applying to the court and applying to the other side, in effect, for consent to use assets, which uh, are arguably the assets of the defendant. Now, in that case, the bank, uh, JSC BTA Bank, the Kazakhstani Bank, has uh, argued that at the point at which Mr. Abliazov draws down on that loan, as in he provides or, or he instructs the, uh, the third party uh, payer to pay our legal fees, at that point when he draws down, that is an asset of Mr. Abliazov, and therefore that asset should fall within the freezing injunction and therefore should not be released to us until consent has been given by the court. We've always argued that there's settled case law that suggests that it goes outside the freezing injunction and we won at first instance. Although the, the judge accepted it was a show as in action, it was an asset, there were circumstances which meant that it wasn't caught by the freezing injunction. Now unfortunately, as is the case in Abliazov, um, Hogan Lovell's acting for the claimant have, have appealed to the Court of Appeal and we shall uh, will be back in court fairly soon on that. But it might sound a, a very small technical point, but in litigating, in fighting fraud cases for the defendant, it's a very, very important point because it could actually restrict a defendant's ability to defend himself in those types of proceedings. The second one is um, privilege. Now, uh, Mr. Abliazov was sentenced to 22 months 
in prison for breaching the freezing injunction on three different grounds. He was found in contempt of court. Uh, we fought a long and hard battle to save him from prison, but um, unfortunately um, that day came. But uh, at the sentencing hearing, unfortunately, Mr. Avliazov didn't turn up. And he's been missing ever since, missing in action. <coughs> so, um, but we do have communication details from Mr. Avliazov. Now, the other side, quite justifiably in a sense, argued that we should hand over those communication details because it was only fair that they should have those details and that that information was not privileged material. We argued to the court that that information is covered by legal professional privilege. Now, we thought uh, there were some arguments that was stretching the point because did that really constitute either the giving of legal advice or the receiving of instructions. Now the court found in our favour, found that it was covered by uh, privilege. Now the flip side of that, if it hadn't been found uh, to be covered by privilege, it would have meant that we would have had to hand over the communication details, almost certainly Mr. Abliazov wouldn't have been able to contact us. I must stress, we do not know and we cannot trace from those communication details where he is. Um, but if, he'd, if we'd had to hand over those details, it may be that they would have been able to source where he is. And on that basis, he wouldn't have been able to, in effect, have a fair <coughs> trial, and it would have been against natural justice. But the third point is probably the killer point. The fight goes on for Mr. Abliazov. As I say, we think he has been politically persecuted by the, uh, by the, I was going to say a word I shouldn't use, but by the leader of the Kazakhstani state. But what has happened is that, as a consequence of not surrendering to the court policeman, the tip staff, and as a consequence of not giving full disclosure in relation to his assets, the court has debarred him from defending the substantive proceedings against him. <coughs> now, we challenged that to the Court of Appeal. We said that that uh, was unfair. Mr. Abliazov would not surrender himself to the criminal authorities here. He feared for his life. There have been assassination attempts on Mr. Abliazov. He feared for his life in prison. He did, wouldn't have the 24-7 security that he had previously. And he feared for his life, and he could not defend himself properly uh, from prison. Now, you might say they're pretty weak <coughs> arguments, but there was some real justification to that. But on a 2-1 majority in the Court of Appeal, they decided that um, his failure to surrender himself to the criminal authorities in this jurisdiction meant he was debarred. He also went down 3-0 as far as his failure to give proper disclosure into the freezing injunction. Now that's going to the Supreme Court. It may well go further than that. But again, it has taken unless orders and debarring orders to another level as far as we're concerned. And it is an extremely draconian step taken by the courts when we're talking about a claim against an individual for over five billion dollars. Anyway, I'll leave it at that and I'll pass on to Ben. Good morning. Um, hands up those in the audience who are lawyers. Excellent. Uh, hands down. Uh, hands up those in the audience who aren't lawyers. More of you, good, even better. Um, hands up Anybody in the audience um, who is a lawyer but doesn't want to admit it? <laughs> Hands down, Ian. Um, <clears throat> right, in summary, uh, in 30 seconds, my talk is this. If you are one of those who put up your hand second, a non-lawyer, um, if you're talking to a lawyer um, and seeking their legal advice, then what you say between you and them um, is confidential and also can't be put before a court. Um, I have two choices now. I either sit down. Um, or I expand on that. Um, I, I've got a, a 10 minute slot. Um, the talk that I'm going to do is actually a, a longer talk that I've done before, um, which lasts um, a bit, well, well, sort of about sort of 50 minutes an hour. I'd be delighted if anybody is interested to give it before. I'm available for hire. <laughs> Weddings, christenings, bar mitzvahs, the lot. Um, Yes, privilege, right, so it's full name, legal professional privilege. Um, essentially, um, when you're um, having any discussions, uh, when you're having any communications, when you're creating documents, um, if it's between you uh, and a lawyer, 
then it's being created um, on a confidential basis. Um, the concept of privilege just takes it that step further. In effect, what it says is, is that confidentiality is so important um, that you're not, um, if you have to go before a court, it's that the court um, not only um, can't find out what was said what, or see those documents that were created um, that are considered privileged, but also um, can't draw any adverse inference from the fact that you won't produce those documents or tell the court what went on during those communications. And this really goes back to our fundamental concepts in England of God, common law um, and of justice. And we see it as fundamentally important um, for somebody to obtain justice that they can go and get um, advice from lawyers. And that advice um, is confidential and between them. And that really is, is the nub of privilege. Um, I suppose it, it seems to work better um, when it's um, an individual um, in a criminal context and it's perhaps a bit more obscure when it's a large multi-corporate um, uh, organisation seeking advice. But the fact remains um, that it's the same. It's the same concept. And it's the same concept for any um, individual um, or legal entity in English common law. And the example that um, Ian has just given um, in terms of Mr uh, Abliazov um, is a very um, telling example of why our courts consider it um, so important um, that for this, our concept of justice um, that individuals um, can receive this advice uh, from, from their lawyers and that, lawyer, that advice remains confidential and their position um, isn't um, I their position um, in terms of uh, justice uh, isn't hindered um, in any way. Um, it's, it's important I think in, in any, um, any time that you're seeking legal advice and privilege is there whenever you're seeking legal advice um, but it's also even more important in many ways I think um, when there has been a fraud and in situations where, where fraud is being, being investigated. And there's a number of factors for that. Um, generally, if there has been a fraud, um, however we choose to, to define fraud, but generally there will be um, criminal issues, um, civil issues. Um, very often, um, certainly for the, for the clients um, that I act for, who are often financial institutions, um, and large corporates who have suffered employee frauds, um, there's big issues of reputation and also I think big issues in terms of um, learning from the fraud to ensure that it's prevented and um, other fraudsters are d deterred from committing frauds again. Um, also there's a danger with any fraud um, that if you get it wrong um, you not only may uh, lose um, in terms of any civil action, you may face a civil action, perhaps an action for defamation um, or if it's an employee fraud um, perhaps um, an action from an employee in employment tribunal. Um, and you also, um, although this happens in, a, in other types of litigation, but also there's very important um, uh, in many frauds uh, in terms of uh, recovering assets, chasing assets, um, and very often freezing those assets. And privilege is important um, whenever uh, legal advice is being obtained, um, but in particular in fraud, um, it's, um, it's essential and essential that it's understood, understood from the outset and not lost. Um, legal professional privilege divides into two types, um, just very briefly. Firstly is um, legal advice communications. And this is, um, covers all your communications uh, with a lawyer uh, when you're seeking um, legal advice. Um, and that bit um, is, is important. Um, a flippant example, if you ask your lawyer um, who's going to win, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, um, their answer, even though they're a lawyer, isn't going to be covered by privilege. Um, but this becomes important on, for less flippant examples um, if you're perhaps seeking advice from a lawyer which is more commercially based. And that can happen both um, from external uh, legal advice, um, but very often um, when you're seeking advice um, in, from an in-house counsel, where the advice you're seeking often um, may not be legal advice at all, it may be more on a commercial basis. So it's essential to know 
um, if you're considering privilege, um, the reasons why you're obtaining that advice and ensuring that advice that you're receiving from the lawyer um, is pure legal advice. The second type of legal professional privilege, which is the one that um, can often be fought over, particularly before a court, um, is the litigation privilege. And this is very helpful when you're um, involved in litigation or contemplating being involved in litigation. Because unlike legal advice privilege, which is between the client um, and the lawyer, it can cover um, work being done by a third party, whether that be communications um, with that third party by the lawyer or communications by the client, um, or documents that are created by a third party when um, litigation uh, is existing or contemplated. So, for example, um, if you as the client or us as the lawyer approaches somebody to um, give evidence uh, with a view to um, obtaining a witness statement, those communications uh, to and from uh, you would be covered by litigation privilege, even though that third party um, isn't seeking legal advice. And that could be very important because you can imagine during your communications um, with a witness um, that uh, those communications, things are shared, information is shared and you're seeking to get their clarity on certain points and also um, seeking to put forward their evidence in a way that supports um, your case or your client's case. Um, you can imagine the fun that could be had if you went to court when a draft witness statement was found um, and was compared, um, and you can do this nowadays easily with Delta View, can't you? It's compared with an existing statement um, and you see which bits have come out um, and the questioning could then be around which bits, uh, why those reasons, why those bits have come out, um, what was being done and what's behind it. So it can potentially um, open doors um, if that sort of document uh, was out there. So litigation privilege um, is between, uh, can be between a lawyer and a client, but can be between the client and a third party, can be a third party creating a document themselves. Um, very important that um, litigation is existing um, or there's a real likelihood it's contemplated. Um, it doesn't work that you create a document then some way down the line you end up in litigation and you say, well, we're now in litigation so we want that document to be privileged. Um, it must be a real likelihood that, it will, um, that there will uh, be litigation at the time that the document or communication is, is created. And just that final point, is that this is when it gets really uh, knotty, um, is when you have um, documents uh, which might be created for uh, a number of purposes. So, for example, I had a case, um, a civil case this was, um, which involved a fraud. And during, prior to, the, to being instructed, a document was created by um, a fraud investigation team. Um, and that document really the, was created um, to explain how the fraud had happened, um, the problems with the controls that were in place and how, those, um, how that client could actually um, put in place controls and procedures to avoid the fraud happening again. It was only in part, in fact it really is a passing part, that um, litigation was thought about. And the difficulty with that report is that it had things that were quite damaging to, to my client, and particularly damaging reputationally, um, but it wasn't privileged. Um, and that was a, an example of, a very, it was a very good report, it was created for the right reasons and it served its purpose. Um, but it didn't um, help us in terms of the, the, the litigation. Um, so, basic concept of privilege, divides into two. Um, we have it for justice. What's the, um, what's the pitfalls? Um, firstly, um, make sure that uh, when you, the advice, or the person that you're taking the advice from, uh, is actually a lawyer. I know this might seem simple, but um, there's currently, the, or I think it might have ended now, but this week the Supreme Court was actually considering a case where uh, some very um, important uh, tax advice um, was given by T PwC. And um, PwC and their client have actually claimed uh, privilege on that advice because the tax advice um, could um, have been given uh, by lawyers and they've said well actually although we're accountants um, it's advice that could have been given by lawyers and therefore 
um, on that basis um, it ought to be privileged. Um, currently, up until now, the courts have said, well, I'm sorry, you're not qualified lawyer, so it doesn't count. And it'd be very interesting to see which way the Supreme Court goes and how that affects the concept of privilege. Um, but it is important because we do actually get legal advice um, from people who aren't lawyers, and, and people are doing this fairly regularly in the, in the society that we live in. Um, another example may well be um, claims management companies or uh, people who sell themselves as business advisors. Um, we, in disputes where we're acting for finance companies against people who've, who've run um, SMEs, and those, often those SMEs, um, when they've had problems and they've sought advice, have actually gone to people who self-style themselves as, as, um, as lawyers, but aren't qualified lawyers. They're people who've set up a limited company to give generic what they call business, business advice, but in effect they actually run the litigation for them. In those circumstances, um, their communications wouldn't be privileged because they're not qualified lawyers. <coughs> so that's not, not quite as silly as it, as it might look as a bullet point. Um, with the lawyer for legal advice, um, that goes back to my um, flippant example about I'm slipped to get out of here. Um, the no litigation contemplated, um, again that's my point about uh, making sure that at the time these communications, uh, when they're uh, or the documents are created that actually litigation is um, either ongoing or, or it is contemplated. It's not something that can be applied back retrospectively. Um, and then there's this issue of the um, dominant purpose test. Um, the reason why this document <coughs> created was the main reason that it was created was in contemplation of legal proceedings. Um, also bear in mind, this happens so often and, and it's, it's very frustrating for, for clients and, and lawyers, is that privilege, once a, do a document is privileged, it remains privileged, but you can waiver that privilege um, and you can lose that privilege um, inadvertently. Um, you can, there's many times actually when you, you agree to waive, waive privilege because it may be, well be that the document is helping you. You may have got a piece of legal advice from leading counsel telling you how brilliant your case is and you may actually wish to show it to the other side. It's, you know, that, that, that does happen. Um, regularly and you actually make the decision to, to waive. But very often we see things that happen um, at clients where things that start documents that started privilege um, have actually been lost, that privilege has been lost and, and often the reason for that is that for something to be privileged it needs to be confidential. We get confidentiality first then we get privilege. But if you take away the confidentiality um, then you lose the privilege. So if I send an email um, as a lawyer to you as my client um, giving you legal advice, if you then forward it on to the other side um, to tell them that they're going to lose the case and um, you're going to beat them up at court, um, then you've waived that, waived that advice. And emails in particular are a very dangerous way for um, privileged documents to be lost. The privilege is there, it's contained in the email, but um, many people may be copied in um, to that email and they may well then forward it on. So the great danger is that you had something, a good document, a document was privileged, but it's been lost because confidentiality hasn't been maintained. And that takes me to my sort of short bits of advice in terms of um, avoiding uh, these pitfalls. Um, mark the documentation. Um, I always use that top one, the confidential and, and legally privileged. Now bear in mind that you can't just put a heading on a document uh, such as that and that will make the document privileged. If you put it on your shopping list it, don't, it just won't work. Um, it does matter what the actual document is itself. Um, but the good thing is, is if you've put that up there, is you've done two things. One, you've demonstrated um, that you think that the document um, is privileged, um, or you might have put it on because you're not quite so sure, but at least you're reserving your position. Um, and secondly, anybody who then looks at that document, um, having read that heading, is warned um, about the privilege and about the confidentiality. So it's always a useful starting point. It's not um, fully uh, determinative, but it's always a useful starting point to actually mark that documentation. Internally, um, and indeed externally, uh, when you're looking at any sort of fraud, do try and keep the teams as small as possible. Um, make sure you know uh, who is 
um, involved in the fraud, who's investigating the fraud and what their role is, and try and get that role defined um, early. Um, in, in email chains that we have nowadays, which happen so quickly, it's very easy, isn't it, that you get brought into an email chain, copied in, you then perhaps send an email, you then get brought out, then other emails are sent, and sometimes you're in, sometimes times you're not. What we do is, particularly with corporate clients um, who have suffered employee frauds, but this, this is across the board, um, is that we try and get them to uh, ensure that they have a small team early on, um, often using um, a non-exec director because they have a nice um, aloofness about them. Um, and then just a small amount of people to be that team who then runs um, the investigation internally and provides the advice, uh, the instructions to you as the lawyer and equally um, as the lawyers to try and keep a tight team. And the tighter it is, the more likely you are to maintain the confidentiality. The looser it is, the less defined and the more the communications are sent around uh, various people, the more likely it is that you will lose that confidentiality. Um, very important, this, this one, it's a little bit sneaky, but very important, is if you don't need to document it, then um, have the communications orally. Um, we often default in creating documents, particularly emails, which sort of form a, um, you know, some sort of, a sort of form of communication somewhere between a, between a letter and, and a conversation. And we often use it when a conversation could be had. If you have a conversation with somebody, um, then um, it's not it's not there in a document, so it's not a document that you're going to have to produce before the court. If you create a document, whether that be an email or whatever, then a decision is going to have to be made um, based on the legal advice as to whether or not it needs to be disclosed. So it's certainly a way of, um, of keeping things that are confidential um, out of the whole privileged sphere. I mean, one example of this that, that you know, I've had practically on a case was a conversation about fraud. Um, which was then minuted on a, on a board meeting. And um, that meant that they were actually not, the difficulty was they weren't actually recording any legal advice. They were just recording that they thought this person was a fraudster. And it wasn't a great document um, to, to send out when we were pursuing the fraudster who claimed he wasn't the fraudster, because uh, it showed the mind of the board. But actually, there was no particular need for them to minute it. It was something that could have been had as, as a conversation. Um, and then they could have um, obtained their, their legal advice. Um, and the last bullet point is the incredibly self-serving, um, involved lawyers with the preparation of um, reports and, and, and interviews, and also make sure that you agree to pay them on their full rate and you pay within 28 days. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the serious point on that is at, it's very much a stitch in time save nine. It doesn't mean that if you're, necessarily that if you're, you're investigating a fraud, you're involved in, in a fraud that you need to bring in the lawyers to do everything for you, but certainly one bit where help can be obtained um, at an early stage uh, is in making sure that you um, maintain uh, privilege and confidentiality. Thank you. I should apologise to those of you who are not FSA regulated. Um, I can only say that I will be brief and you'll be pleased to hear it. and I'm sure by the end of uh, my presentation you'll be pleased that you're not um, within a, a regulated business. Um, <clears throat> some time ago, uh, several years ago after the, the crisis and the identification of issues around um, the regulatory failings that were uh, perceived to have existed at the FSA, um, the FSA changed its approach to its role and, and the way in which it regulates. And you have here a quote from the FSA um, then Chief Executive about probably looking quite enviously at the uh, SFO, saying that uh, it, it, it was perceived that the FSA was somebody that in, the industry wasn't scared of, wasn't afraid of, um, and since then they've essentially set out to, uh, to change that. And my presentation could probably be neatly summed up by this um, helpful cartoon, um, which I've had on my wall, uh, my office wall, for some, some years now. It's, some, it's, it's, some, it's considerably out of date in terms of when it was published, but it's still very, very relevant in terms of what um, we experience and what firms are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you'll be aware that we've got a new uh, regulatory architecture coming into place. The government have decided that, uh, that they'll sweep away the problems of the past by some new acronyms. Um, and I think that the reality is that they are um, largely just about uh, new names, new labels for um, what is effectively the same body of people uh, performing the same function, uh, albeit with slightly <coughs> different powers. 
um, the FCA uh, document. There's a, a an hour long presentation tomorrow morning if you want to come back for more um, bacon sandwiches um, on the FCA. Uh, but they've, they've published a, a, a consultation document, which is um, well, not really a consultation document, which is long on on rhetorical statements about their aggr aggressive status and, and the stature, um, but not a great deal of detail. I think what is interesting. Um, uh, it, it is the way in which firms are now being treated by the FSA and the way in which the FSA approaches its role, um, particularly in relation to supervision. Um, I don't have the time to, to go through all the new powers. Um, essentially where they are now is, is about being intensive, intrusive, interventionist in everything that they do. Uh, they've moved away from being respond, uh, reactive so that where firms mess up and there is a mis-selling scandal they get involved and try and clear up the mess, they now want to try to prevent the scandal from occurring. Ambitious I may say, uh, because it requires a significant amount of uh, educated assessment of, of the situation, um, which many think is probably beyond the FSA, um, but we shall see. Um, they are moving to what they refer to as judgment-based uh, regulation. You will have heard um, in the press a great deal about the focus on culture. Um, we've had a number of high-profile cases recently which have identified that some individuals in the financial services sector don't operate with the levels of integrity that the FSA would expect. Um, and in order to try to rectify that, the FSA have set about something called credible deterrence, uh, which is uh, essentially uh, all about more, um, more fines, higher fines, uh, and more actions against um, senior management. A couple of quotes here emphasising the difference of approach in relation to the role of enforcement at the FSA. Um, you'll see for yourself that, that, that um, you know, Sir Callum McCarthy was quick to, to emphasise that the FSA was not enforcement-led. Lord Turner um, has since decided that uh, that needed to change, or has changed. Uh, in the words of uh, a senior FSA representative, when asked whether or not the FSA <coughs> was now enforcement-led, uh, he said, no, 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 of course we're not enforcement-led, we're, no lo we're just no longer not enforcement-led, which, which is, is helpful. <clears throat> One of the things that is a focus for the FSA now, and it's an incredibly difficult thing for firms to respond to, is the focus on senior management responsibility, attacking individuals. Um, this is a statement from the FSA annual report which says that we consider that actions against individuals has a greater deterrent effect. Well, who, who would have thought? Um, you know, if you are facing individual disciplinary sanctions where you are, you are going to be required to pay a financial penalty or to lose your career, um, then you are going to think more carefully than you might do if you were just calling on your um, PI insurers to pay uh, for the cost of a mistake. Uh, the John Pottage decision, I could do a whole seminar on this alone, it's a fantastic case um, demonstrating uh, the need sometimes to push back against the FSA. John Pottage was the chief executive of UBS's wealth management business, uh, faced accusations that he'd failed to perform his role properly and was facing a £100,000 fine. Um, he took that case to the tribunal, uh, fought the FSA all the way and, and thankfully he won. Uh, but in doing so he did... Um, the, the, the courts, the tribunal did decide um, some very important points which are worth noting for senior management. And that's that essentially we've moved from a situation where you could be disciplined for misconduct to a situation where uh, you now have to proactive, proactively identify issues. Um, you, you have to be very, very good at your job in order to avoid for the potential for disciplinary sanction, which is which is quite a threat for individuals, I think. You know, particularly if you're a chief executive, where your concerns will be about profit, uh, not necessarily about compliance. Um, we've seen an introduction of, of Damoclean letters. There was a, a, a where, whereby one person has to be nominated as responsible for a particular issue, and of course, if that issue goes wrong, that person then is, is hung out to dry by the FSA. Um, and we saw it this week with the consultation paper, uh, where the consultation paper comes with some attest attestation wording at the back, uh, which a chief executive has to sign uh, to say that he has read that document, that he's reviewed, he's undertaken a review of his business and none of the problems identified by the FSA exist within that business or that they've been fixed. Of course that attestation is written in blood and if there is a problem subsequently the FSA will come back for that individual. So again, you know, it's quite a difficult situation for individuals at the top of those organisations. Um, you'll all have seen the FSA has been quite aggressive in relation to market abuse and insider dealing. Uh, 14 convictions for insider dealing since 2009, uh, more on the way, um, some involving financial institutions. And one other point that's worth making around uh, it, in terms of the regulatory environment, um, the FSA has relinquished its policy making role to uh, Europe. We now have a number of European supervisory authorities um, who 
have taken up the policy making role um, and the UK no longer has a role to, well, uh, it has a role to play but only in the sense that it tries to influence as one of the member states uh, what, what comes out of Europe, which is, for those of you involved in the industry will know, uh, that what, what Europe, what comes out of Europe uh, is not always necessarily great for the UK industry and I think it's a real concern um, for lots of the people we speak to about how the, how the regulatory environment will develop. I've asked the question, should you be afraid of the FSA? Um, uh, it's obviously been a very, very quick run through. Um, and I think the reality is that, that the FSA is much more aggressive. It is much more intrusive. It's much more difficult to live with the FSA. Um, but at the same time, most firms are well run um, and have nothing to be afraid of. And what they do need to do is to be aware of um, uh, where we are in terms of the regulatory environment, to be proactive in identifying issues and, and tracking issues uh, and be prepared. Um, this is a, the, the nothing to fear, but fear itself quote is obviously from FDR um, in, the, in the context of the Great Depression, so possibly quite um, apposite for a number of reasons. But one of the things that we have seen, and which does worry me, is that the fear which firms have of the FSA forces them into positions where they are prepared to make concessions which they're not really obliged to make. Um, you, know, you see firms making settled case, settling cases for fear of upsetting or, or further aggravating the regulator in circumstances where they're sacrificing their legal rights, potentially sacrificing their defence of civil claims. Um, you know, I think it's a real problem. It's, very diff it's e easy for me to say and very difficult for firms to do, but I think there will come a point where firms and the industry has to push back against the FSA um, and not be afraid. Um, so that's uh, a very quick run through. I hope that was uh, interesting for you. Well, in March 2011, 9th of March, I was getting ready to come to a breakfast briefing, a bit like this one, and just before I left the house, I got a telephone call, which was, your, my boss was arrested and our offices were under dawn raid. <coughs> what next? Um, I was the senior litigation counsel for Vincent Chengiz, and... As many of you no doubt read in the press that day and for many days afterwards, the offices, over 130 police officers and SFO officers, uh, arrested over nine uh, suspects and um, raided a number of different premises. So, what do you do? You'll see both in your packs and um, on the slides uh, a number of tips, pre-raid tips, do's, some more do's, <laughs> and don'ts. But what I thought I'd spend today, rather than going through line by line, and particularly because we've only got 10 minutes, is really to talk about what it feels like when you're in that raid situation. Obviously, having your kind of laminate which tells you what to do is quite helpful. But what's the first thing you do? The first thing I did as I was running to the station was ring the lawyers. Now, how many lawyers, which lawyers do you need? Well, the first thing we thought about was conflict because you need someone to represent the suspects and then someone to represent the company because there may well eventually be conflict between the two and what actually happened with us was there was no conflict between the two that we found but there were different steps that, that the company wanted to take than the, the person who was actually under investigation and we used that to the advantage of the process and by that was how we used the judicial review process and that's a whole nother talk but you want to think about having someone protecting directors or people who are investigated and the company that's being um, raided so we found two sets of lawyers and obviously the person who are the people who are representing the suspect who's arrested needs to have at least white collar crime experience and know how to act in the police station. It was vitally important with someone like Vincent 
that the person who went down to the police station who was seeing him could tell him and be robust in their advice that they shouldn't, he shouldn't be answering the questions, uh, that there was no comment at that stage. Um, we obviously had no idea, other than the warrant, what people were looking at, what form the investigation would take. So, and actually the pre-disclosure, interview disclosure that came out had very little later on to do with the wider investigation. So the really first point was, don't answer any questions. And that's very hard for a very strong person who's used to always being right. So that's the first thing. Then we had um, a second set of lawyers that were acting for the company. Now the obvious answer for us in this case were the lawyers who were representing Consensus Business Group and the Trust in the civil litigation relating to counting because it was all about the same subject. So the third set of lawyers you need is a reputation management lawyer. Now that may come from one of the same teams, or in our case it came from a different law firm entirely, but it was the person who'd been representing Consensus Business Group for a long time in reputation management issues. And that whole piece is really important. When we arrived at the offices, the Daily Mail were already outside, and that was a whole subject of Operation Wheating and Leveson, and I won't go into that, but the big thing was the press. I can go back, but I put up on the screen uh, a number of the headlines of that day. There we go. Um, press was really important. What's the message you're going to get out? Um, particularly for Vincent and Robbie, the two, two of them were in different situations. There were different allegations against the two of them, and yet the press, in everywhere we saw it, was always the Chengiz brothers. Uh, you're not only just giving out a message to the press, you also got to get out your messages to your staff, to investors. If you are a PLC, a listed company, you've got to think about what are you telling people inside? Do you need to tell the market? Who needs to go first? Can't, you don't want to be inadvertently telling people things internally that will get out to the market and affect the share price or, make, or, or start an insider dealing situation. So all those issues need to be thought about at the same time. So you've got your lawyers and you need enough lawyers to man mark the SFO investigators and police. And that's really important because I mean, in our case, there were over 130 amongst the different offices. As the two days continued, more and more people piled in. So you had a certain number on the first day, and as people finished doing other places, more would come to our offices. Um, I got there, the first thing I did was introduce myself to uh, the police officers. And I asked on every dawn rate thing, the first thing it says is, ask the investigators to wait in a document-free room and ensure someone stays with them. Has anyone here been involved in a dawn rate? Did your investigators stay in a document-free room? <laughs> uh, no. I don't think, I, I mean, we can all ask, but the truth is the investigators have a warrant and that warrant gives them the right to be there, gives them the right to search. So quite frankly, they say, well, here's my warrant, I'm allowed to search. So the key things you want to look at are, what does the warrant say? Are the premises right? And one of the warrants for Vincent's home, the address of the premises wasn't right. It referred, it, the, the premises were over two buildings and the warrant only referred to one of those buildings. And the room where they wanted to take all the documents out was, the wrong, was in the wrong part of the house. 
So we had a big debate. Do we tell them? Well, the obvious answer was they would just go off to court and change the warrant. Um, and you, you really can't be obstructive. So that's also a, an important point. So we didn't tell them, but they realized. So they cleared this whole room out, bagged everything, realized they were in the wrong room, emptied everything out, put it back, went to court, came back with another warrant, and then took it out again. And that's really the point, that if they get it wrong, they're going to go and change it. But if it's completely wrong, the wrong address, um, or you want to see, does it cover the basement you own in the other building? Does it, what is the subject matter? So in our case, it was counting and related to particular ground rent issues. Well, that meant straight away, all the areas that didn't deal with those issues, they couldn't take documents around it. So it's really important the terms of those warrants and that everyone in your team has a photocopy of, those warrant, of the warrant. Second point is privilege. Now we've had Ben's talk about privilege, but it actually comes into stark reality when you're in the middle of your dawn raid because the documents which are clearly privileged should not be taken. Where there is a doubt with privilege, it gets put into a special bag and is debated about later. Now on site there are supposed to be independent solicitors <coughs> who are looking at privilege and can make a decision straight away. Traditionally those people have been independent barristers, but what we found were that they were SFO lawyers from a different team. Now that was supposed to be subject to debate in the judicial review, but it wasn't actually addressed whether that was right or wrong. But it is worth noting that fact. Now for all of you with offices, um, the, the offices that were solicitors' offices, which were clearly marked as solicitors' offices, and it had you know, legally and professionally privileged documents in this room, they were much better at looking through. So all my files that were neatly marked, privileged and confidential, they didn't even bother looking at. The bits that they were interested on were the open, loose leaf papers that were in filing things. Because I'm quite good at filing, I had very few of those. They did my Roman probably 20 minutes. The lawyer next door to me, was one of those lawyers that never filed, had piles of stuff everywhere, nothing in, in doc files. They went through his documents page by page by page, three lawyers, three hours, then they decided they got it wrong, the next day they did it all over again. So it's a real kind of point. File your stuff, keep it tidy, make sure there is an expectation if you're a lawyer that it's privileged. Um, and really, that's what a lot of the, when you're man marking the SFO police in the offices, the biggest thing is saying, actually, that's privileged. Um, we provided a list of all the lawyers who were involved, internal, external the law firms, the names of the lawyers, and we hand print photocopied it and handed it out to all the different uh, SFO officers so that they could see at a glance who these people were. It was really important when they were taking all the computer screens, downloading all the computer uh, imaging, because we could say straight away, well, these people are lawyers. You don't even need to take their documents. Um, the other thing these man-marking people were doing were um, taking a note of what was happening and also commenting when it was clearly outside the warrant, so something entirely different. Now again, you always have to remember there is a warrant and you can't obstruct the officers. So it really is that fine line between being polite and um, cooperative but making the point clearly and make, taking a note where the points aren't accepted. 
and then that can form part of your judicial review. Now I know we're running out of time and Rob's got his speech to do, so I'm not going to go on for much longer, but the other just few key points are, pick a coordinator. That coordinator should be in a central place. Everyone comes back to that place, reports on what's going on. They, they know where the investigators are. We set up a dialogue with the investigators. We agreed because it was a big building that we would start on X floor. And so we had people on those floors uh, and then they wouldn't do a different floor until we were all ready to do that floor. We agreed when we would all have a break for lunch. We agreed when we would stop in the evening and we got an undertaking that they would not search without us overnight. And so the only thing that was done overnight was the downloading of the computer system. Uh, and that was only done while our computer person was there. The, the last thing is just make sure you have an action plan, who you're going to call, who internally you want there, who can make the decisions on press, who can make the decisions on um, uh, the big decisions that need to be made. But um, your laminates, our numbers are on it. Always pleased to come and talk to you some more in more detail. Um, and if you need us, our mobiles are there. <clears throat> That's a demonstration of how technically adept I am. Um, <clears throat> you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to talk to you about, give you investment advice. I'm actually going to talk about politically exposed persons, uh, which are important, of course, in terms of anti-money laundering and all of our obligations in, ter in terms of anti-money laundering. Um, can I start by asking whether anyone here is not familiar with the expression politically exposed person? Well, I've got one. Well, this talk's just for you. <laughs> um, the, the definition of political, politically exposed persons actually set out in the money laundering regulations and I've put it up on the screen, uh, which of course is derived from the money laundering, the European money laundering directive. Um, it's a curious definition in many ways. Um, the thing that I found in, in considering this, uh, in terms of considering the talk that I was giving you today, is that, uh, or the most curious aspect, is the fact that it, it is time limited. Um, so while the regulations prescribe that it's anyone who uh, ha has been entrusted with a prominent public function uh, outside the UK or the EU, um, it is at any time in the preceding year. So strictly speaking in terms of the definition, if somebody was a member of parliament in Tanzania, uh, but they ceased being a member of parliament over a year ago, they ceased to be a politically exposed person. Now, in all circumstances, and given that we all are in a, um, uh, uh, under obligations to, ass to, to, to assess risks uh, in terms of taking on potential clients, I don't think the fact that somebody uh, was an MP in Tanzania but ceased to be a year and a day ago uh, is going to save you in all, in all the circumstances from having uh, to conduct enhanced customer due diligence. Because a risk, in terms of making a risk-based assessment, you should still be taking into account all of the factors that apply to any individual, and that will include jurisdictional risk. So if they are coming from a country uh, where <coughs> there are heightened levels of corruption, then the fact that they have cease to be a member of a government or a parliament uh, isn't necessarily going to protect you. Uh, I thought um, of, of illustrating um, the, the issue of, of the difficulties that can arise in relation to considering who a politically exposed person is by thinking about some of the most obvious examples. Uh, and, and these are people who immediately leapt to mind. Now. Um, I hope that most of you can identify at least three of the people on that slide, if not four. I think the fourth uh, may be a factor of age uh, rather than anything else. But uh, 
does anyone want to hazard a guess at who the gentleman at the top left of the screen is? Does anyone is anyone able to identify him? Yes, his his name is General Sonny Abacha. Um, in many ways, he could be considered to be the Ill the illegitimate father of the money laundering regime. Um, for those of you who who aren't familiar with him, he was a. a a, a military dictator who seized power in Nigeria in the 1990s and then set about fairly systematically looting the country uh, for the enrichment of himself and his family. It, he uh, has been found or estimated to have stolen somewhere between two and four billion dollars uh, over the period of the 1990s. Unfortunately he himself is no longer with us, he died. Um, but I have to say, I grew up as a, uh, as a civil fraud lawyer on stories about uh, Mr. Abacha uh, and members of his family arriving at Heathrow uh, quite literally with suitcases stuffed with cash um, and being, being caught in customs. Uh, the gentleman on the right, on the top right of the screen, I'm sure is, is very familiar to all of you over the last year. Uh, his name is Muammar Gaddafi. We have, of course, Robert Mugabe and Bashar al-Assad, who uh, is featuring a lot in, um, in the current press. Now, obviously, two of the people on that slide are now, are now dead, uh, and I wouldn't be selling life insurance for either of the other two. Um, in terms of there being politically exposed persons, there is one factor which, which makes them, the fact that they are peps, completely irrelevant. Does anyone know what it is? All of them were subject to sanctions. So it, in terms of, of your consideration and due diligence, as soon as you identify they're on a sanctions list, the fact that they, they were PEPs in itself becomes pretty much a by the by. Um, why, why PEPs are important in the, in the current environment is that uh, things continue to evolve and one thing that even uh, uh, those at HMRC are quick to remind us of is that things like the Arab Spring um, have, have led to a whole new um, category of class of people becoming politically exposed persons. And they're not the people who would automatically uh, spring to mind. And it is a reason to be in the current environment very alive to this as an issue. Um, there are new and tighter sanctions against places like Syria and Iran, and there are continuing sanctions against countries, many of which you know, may have fallen out of your consideration. <coughs> and as an illustration of that, um, I would hope, and, and, and in contrast to the last set of pictures I showed you, I would expect that most of you can identify one person on that slide. Is anyone able to identify anyone else? <coughs> I'll go to, I, I had to write their names down because there's no way on earth I was going to remember them. The gentleman at the top left is Mohammed Yusuf al Mogariev. He's the president of the General National Congress of Libya since August 2012, and he's the de facto interim leader of Libya and therefore a politically exposed person. Uh, the gentleman on the top right is Ahmed Moaz al Khatib. He was elected as the leader of the new umbrella Syrian opposition group in Doha, Qatar this past weekend. Uh, you could perhaps consider him the leader-elect of Syria, depending on how you wanted to approach things. But obviously, he doesn't actually hold any formal position at present. Uh, the gentleman bottom left is Rashid al Ghanoushi. He's the intellectual leader of the Anada or Resurrection Movement in Tunisia. That, is, uh, the, that movement is the largest party in the new assembly, which has been elected to agree on a new constitution for Tunisia, under which they'll then hold free and fair elections. Uh, he is a PEP. Uh, and then uh, the one I expect is known to all of you is uh, Ong San Suu Kyi, uh, who is the leader of the National League for Democracy Party in Myanmar or Burma. Uh, and as of 1 April 2012, she's a member of parliament and therefore a PEF. Now, why is that important? Um, there are enormous amounts of money sloshing around as a result of the Arab Spring in particular. Uh, lots of people who are not used to government uh, and are in countries which are a jurisdictional risk are now in charge of huge amounts of government revenue. Uh, and so while these people aren't going to trigger an automatic query from you because you're not going to recognize them, you have no reason to, um, they're, they're, you do need to be alive to the pep risk that they represent. 
Uh, what we, what I have seen, I have to say, over the last 15 years in London is that increasingly where politically exposed person comes up, people tend to step back and say, look, we don't really want your business, move on. Um, to the extent that there are any private practice lawyers in the room who aren't at AG, I'm happy for you to continue doing that because that leaves more for the rest of us. Uh, but otherwise, what you need to consider um, is that you are risking turning away very valuable business if you are too too strict in, in automatically saying that somebody's a pep, therefore we don't want to work with them. Um, and I tried to think of the best illustration I could of that. Um, you, you, uh, I, I was going to put up some pictures of, of some of our clients, but then thought better of it. Um, <laughs> but you've heard quite a lot about them this morning anyway. Um, but obviously, there, in terms of fee income, there, there are people out there who are definitely PEPs or former PEPs, and they represent very valuable business. Um, the one illustration I thought uh, I could point out was uh, a gentleman who, who has um, figured large in, in the last three years of my life, uh, who's a guy by the name of Roman Abramovich. Now, he is now one of the world, recognized as one of the wealthiest men in the world. Uh, he has an enormous amount of business to do. Would you turn him away? He is a former governor of the, of the Russian Republic of Tchaikovsky. Uh, he's a former member of, of the Russian Duma. And as such, uh, he, he won't now fall within the definition of PEP, strictly speaking, because he seized those positions more than 12 months ago. But he is still someone who is going to fall on that radar. Uh, and if you are automatically turning away anyone who's got political exposure, um, then he, he represents the, the valuable business that you could be turning away. Thanks very much.